his uh, miraculous speech. Uh, it is, in my view, the finest foreign policy speech ever given by an American president. Uh, it is uh, startling in its wisdom, uh, in its uh, rhetoric, in its eloquence, in its uh, practical results, in its lessons for today. Uh, and it's as many times, I don't know whether it's dozens or hundreds that I've watched the speech, uh, each time uh, I get a, a lump in my throat uh, and uh, I just am mesmerized by uh, some of the ideas uh, and, uh, and the, the turns of phrase. Let me uh, give quickly uh, a little bit of historical context to this speech. Uh, and the results of the speech, and then talk about our, our current uh, challenges. The speech, of course, was given uh, June 10, 1963. This was the absolute height of the Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis had uh, occurred just a few months uh, earlier in October 1962. Uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, the two nuclear superpowers, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, had come uh, within a hair's breadth of nuclear war that would have led to a global nuclear annihilation. I'll say a word about that uh, in, in a moment. But this is a speech in the aftermath of that. The Cuban Missile Crisis ended peacefully uh, essentially, uh, thanks to Kennedy and his counterpart in the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev. Both of them had advisors who thought that war was inevitable in October 1962. As uh, most of you will know, when Kennedy was presented with the pictures of taken by a U-2 uh, spy plane uh, over Cuba, showing uh, the placement of uh, missile sites uh, in Cuba by the Soviet Union, Kennedy convened a, an executive committee, XCOM, it became famously uh, called. And in XCOM, uh, we have the transcripts uh, of, uh, and the tapes, uh, actually, of the sessions. And what is startling about XCOM is that at the start, uh, almost every single advisor of President Kennedy was in favor of a uh, military strike in Cuba uh, to be launched uh, within hours or days of uh, this uh, finding of missile sites. <clears throat> the CIA uh, said that the uh, missiles uh, were not yet operational. This was uh, almost surely wrong. Most of the intelligence uh, in detail was wrong. Uh, the number of uh, Soviet troops uh, on the ground in Cuba was much larger than the CIA believed. The chance that such a strike would have led to a nuclear exchange and ultimately to a full-scale nuclear war was extraordinarily high. Uh, and yet, based on uh, wrong instincts, wrong intelligence uh, and a failure to understand and think through this crisis, almost all of the advisors at the beginning said that there was no option but a military option. Uh, Khrushchev uh, was, of course, surrounded by advisors who felt that war was also extraordinarily likely. In the end, Kennedy uh, delayed. Uh, he thought, he asked himself constantly, why did the Soviets do this? Uh, what is uh, Chairman Khrushchev thinking? And how do we get out of this without destroying the world? And in the end, as you know, uh, an agreement was reached, uh, partly public, partly secret. Uh, one part of the agreement uh, was that the United States would never again uh, try to invade Cuba as it had done in the Bay of Pigs invasion in the spring of 1961. 
the Soviets agreed to withdraw their uh, missiles. And secretly, the United States agreed uh, after a few months space that it would withdraw uh, the US uh, missiles uh, in Turkey that were aimed at the Soviet Union. So there was a reciprocity to it, which unfortunately was not learned by the public for decades afterwards. So there was a public perception that the United States had fully forced the Soviet Union to back down Whereas, in fact, there was a, a true compromise reached uh, with the nuclear missile sites removed from both sides. But what had happened was a, a near miracle uh, that uh, through reason, through a steady hand, through Kennedy's belief uh, that Khrushchev was also trying to find a peaceful way out through the very good uh, work and advice of a few others, uh, notably the US ambassador to the UN, Adlai Stevenson, and the UN Secretary General, Utant, uh, this diplomatic solution was reached. And of course, in the final days, uh, uh, President Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, played a very important role in opening a back channel to uh, the Soviet ambassador in Washington to help make the arrangements for this diplomatic solution. So the speech is in the backdrop of uh, nearly ending the world. And after those events, Khrushchev and Kennedy, uh, I think both appreciated uh, that they uniquely in the world had a responsibility to pull the world back from from the brink and they also had a kind of uh, mutual respect by that point after having nearly come to complete armageddon uh, they realized that each other had pulled back and used reason and in effect trusted uh, the counterpart and so there was a certain uh, certain belief uh, by both that they could reach an agreement. This speech was part of Kennedy's campaign in 1963 to pull back from the brink. And that was both uh, in aim of some specific achievements, notably a test ban treaty uh, that would uh, stop nuclear testing, and also a more general desire to improve relations with the Soviet Union. So this speech should be seen as part of a peace campaign by President Kennedy to pull the United States and the Soviet Union back from the brink and to uh, help the world to breathe again after the uh, closest uh, humanity has ever come to its self-destruction. Incidentally, uh, there's a phenomenal book about the Cuban Missile Crisis written by the late and truly great historian Martin Sherwin. Uh, it's uh, this book called Gambling with Armageddon, and I strongly recommend it. It's a thrilling read but it's also an extraordinary historical accomplishment because Sherwin gets to the minute by minute understanding of what the different uh, uh, actors uh, in this drama were thinking and how this worked. One of the things that he describes, which I said I would come back to briefly, is the fact that even after Kennedy and Khrushchev had reached this diplomatic Accord, we almost had nuclear war by accident. And that was because, as many of you will know, but probably not all of you, there was a disabled Soviet submarine that had been sent to Cuba as part of this uh, operation. It was disabled, it was uh, uh, submerged, and it was out of contact with Moscow. And uh, it was uh, suffering from uh, overheating and a need to surface. And the uh, captain of this submarine 
did not know whether there was a war going on uh, on the surface or not. It happened that this was a flotilla of uh, seven, I believe, uh, submarines of the Soviet uh, Union in this location in the Caribbean. And in that flotilla, this was the single submarine that had a nuclear tipped torpedo uh, as part of its arsenal. As the submarine started to surface, depth charges were dropped on the submarine by the US Air Force. And the captain believed that the submarine was facing a, a war above the surface and he ordered the nuclear tipped torpedo into the torpedo bay. Under US military doctrine of that day, had such a weapon been used against the US, a nuclear weapon, the US doctrine was that the US would unleash uh, its full nuclear arsenal at the Soviet Union at the Central and Eastern European countries like Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland uh, that were in the Soviet bloc and at mainland China. And the estimates of the day were that uh, around 700 million people would die almost instantly. And uh, the torpedo was in the bay about to be fired when the chief of staff of the flotilla said, maybe it's not a good idea to fire this. Maybe we should surface. And his uh, vote was needed uh, among three of the officers to fire the torpedo. And he blocked it. And he saved the world. He's uh, the unknown man who saved the world. Uh, I'd wager not too many of you would know the name Vasily Arkhipov, but uh, he saved the world by saying better not to fire better we surface of course when they surfaced they found out that uh, there was no war and they uh, made their way back to russia and the world was saved so kennedy gave this speech in the shadow of those events and with the desire to pull the world back from the brink and in the spring of 1963, there was another protagonist, uh, Pope John XXIII, dying of cancer, uh, a most wondrous uh, Pope who, of course, had uh, led to Vatican II, dying and determined to also add to the uh, restoration of some kind of basic security on the planet. And uh, the Pope issued an encyclical in the spring of 1963, uh, Pachem in Terrace, Peace on Earth. And uh, copies uh, in Russian and in English were immediately transmitted to Khrushchev and to Kennedy. And that also added to this, very much added to this belief that something could be done and needed to be done uh, that uh, moment. Now, we all heard together the speech. I just want to emphasize a few basic points. First, it's wonderful and eloquent, and it was uh, co-drafted with uh, Ted Sorensen, uh, Kennedy's most brilliant speechwriter and counselor and friend and partner. And uh, I got to know Sorensen very well uh, in, in the last years of Sorensen's life. And he was a one, wonderful person. And I think this was one of his greatest, if not his greatest accomplishments uh, and gifts to the world. So the speech is gorgeous. <laughs> a second obvious point is Kennedy does not point fingers at the Soviet Union, not at all. The speech is about Americans reconsidering our own attitudes towards peace, to overcome the pessimism, the belief that peace is impossible, the belief that we are gripped by forces we cannot control. And Kennedy says, no, we can solve these problems, but we need to look at our own attitudes in fact, when he speaks about the Soviet Union, 
he speaks in complementary terms, not about the Soviet system, which he says uh, is not to America's liking, uh, but he says no government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. As Americans, we find communism profoundly repugnant as a negation of personal freedom and dignity, but we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. And I think this is extraordinary uh, and it worked. Kennedy also told the American people, yes, you can make treaties with the other side because Americans are constantly told by hardliners, oh, you can't negotiate. You can't negotiate with the other side. They're evil, they're perfidious. And Kennedy says, no, great powers will agree to and will follow treaties that are in their interest. Of course, there should be monitoring. Of course, there should be care. But the idea that there can be mutual benefit is the rational understanding of the dilemma that we find ourselves in with an adversary. So Kennedy said, of course, we can make a practical and attainable peace. And he said, indeed, as we heard, that it is the necessary rational end of rational men. Kennedy also expressed repeatedly a view that he also made in another wondrous speech a few weeks after this one to the Irish Parliament that don't consider any other country your permanent enemy. This is a huge mistake in history. And in the Irish Dale, when he spoke to the Irish Parliament, he said this, hostility today is a fact, but it is not a ruling law. The supreme reality of our time is our indivisibility as children of God and our common vulnerability on this planet. So this was one of Kennedy's deepest themes. We do not have a permanent enemy with the Soviet Union. We have differences, of course, but we have common interests and we can address those common interests and do so in a rational manner. Now, just to uh, close this historical moment, Kennedy gave the speech on June 10, 1963. Incidentally, he gave also the greatest speech ever given by an American president on civil rights the very next day uh, on uh, June 11, 1963, when he spoke about uh, desegregation uh, and uh, he had the rapt attention of the nation and of Martin Luther King Jr., who was amazed by Kennedy's uh, eloquence and passion. And on that speech the next day, on June 11, 1963, Kennedy said about the civil rights movement, we are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. And this was the same extraordinarily high ethics that Kennedy brought to both of these speeches on the international scene and on the domestic scene. And you heard at the end of the uh, peace speech how he related the two. They were the same in his eyes. Uh, we can't have an international morality if we don't have morals at home. Uh, we cannot help to find safety in the world if we don't have safety and justice at home. So this was back to back. Now, when Kennedy gave the speech, Khrushchev listened, listened in attentively and regarded it as astounding as it was. And he immediately summoned the special envoy of Kennedy to Russia, Avril Harriman. And he told Avril Harriman, this is the finest speech by an American president since Franklin Roosevelt. And he said, I want to make peace with your president. And six weeks later, on July 25th, 1963, the 
partial nuclear test ban treaty was signed six weeks later. And then it was ratified. Then Kennedy knew he was a great politician as well as a great statesman. And he knew he had to win the support of the American people. He toured the country to explain why this was to the benefit of the American people, because he was afraid uh, of his own generals. He was afraid of the uh, right wingers. He was afraid of the military industrial complex that they would somehow block this. So he took this treaty to the American people directly and then won an overwhelming assent of the Senate and the treaty went into force. Soon afterwards, it was signed by dozens of other countries and Kennedy's last great foreign policy speech was to the United Nations uh, to bring to the world on September 20, 1963, the fruits of this peace campaign, the partial nuclear test ban treaty. And let me read to you the penultimate paragraph of Kennedy's incredible speech to the United Nations. This is Kennedy speaking to all the world leaders assembled in front of him in the UN General Assembly. And he tells the world leaders, two years ago, I told this body that the United States had proposed and was willing to sign a limited test ban treaty. Today, that treaty has been signed. It will not put an end to war. It will not remove basic conflicts. It will not secure freedom for all, but it can be a lever. And Archimedes, in explaining the principles of the lever, was said to have declared to his friends, give me a place where I can stand and I shall move the world. My fellow inhabitants of this planet, let us take our stand here in this assembly of nations and let us see if we in our time can move the world to a just and lasting peace. And those were his last words to world leaders. A few weeks later, he was killed. I think on the weight of the evidence, most likely by uh, probably parts of the US government in a coup. Uh, I think he died because he was campaigning for peace. Uh, and uh, I would guess that the CIA or uh, rogue operators uh, were part of uh, a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy and kill him because he was a peacemaker. And as Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. So today, today we are closer to nuclear war than ever. Today we are 90 seconds from midnight, according to the doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Our five most recent presidents have all brought us closer to Armageddon. Only a few presidents took us away from Armageddon. Kennedy, Eisenhower before him, Richard Nixon in uh, detente uh, with China and with the Soviet Union. But unfortunately, uh, since the end of the Cold War, supposedly in 1991, the neoconservatives took over American politics they didn't view the end of the Cold War as the beginning of a mutually respectful multipolar world. They took the end of the Cold War as the beginning of American sole superpower primacy, that America could run the world and would run the world, and that the US was now free to take out its enemies, to launch wars of choice, to do exactly what Kennedy said the US would never do, to start wars that did not have to be started, to overthrow regimes. And since 1992, when the doomsday clock was put at 17 minutes from midnight, the farthest from disaster ever, it has now 
approached to 90 seconds to midnight. Clinton brought us closer to disaster by reneging on the U.S. commitment to not moving NATO one inch eastward and started the NATO enlargement and bombed a European capital, Belgrade, for 78 straight days in 1999. George W. Bush Jr. brought us even closer to midnight by launching two wars, both unnecessary, Afghanistan and especially the war in Iraq on completely phony premises, and by unilaterally abandoning the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002, which was one of the bulwarks of the nuclear stability that Kennedy had helped to put into place. President Obama brought us again closer to midnight by launching a CIA operation to overthrow Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, Operation Timber Sycamore, and by launching NATO to overthrow Libyan President Muammar Gaddafi, putting in place two absolutely uh, terrible conflicts that continue to this day, and by unleashing a regime change operation in Ukraine in February 2014. The point person was Victoria Nuland, who uh, overthrew where the U.S. contributed to the overthrow of Ukraine President Viktor Yanukovych starting the war in Ukraine. Donald Trump took us still closer to midnight, uh, walking away, for example, from the uh, JCPOA treaty that had been negotiated with Iran uh, and uh, intensifying uh, instability vis-a-vis -vis China. And Joe Biden has taken us again, still closer to just 90 seconds to midnight, now on three fronts. Biden refused negotiations over NATO enlargement that could have avoided the war in Ukraine. And the Biden administration told Ukraine to walk away from negotiations in March 2022, based on Ukraine's neutrality, saying you can defeat Russia, a profound blunder and miscalculation, but a horrific uh, invitation to uh, global danger. Now the United States is complicit in a genocide ongoing in Gaza. Every day we see more deaths of innocents. Israel rejects ceasefires, uh, even though the U.S. propaganda says that it's Hamas rejecting them. Hamas has accepted the ceasefire proposal twice. Israel has rejected it, and we have reached 37,000 dead. And Biden is brandishing the sword in Taiwan, sending armaments to Taiwan in contravention of the 1960, 1982 uh, U.S. People's Republic of China communique, which said the U.S. would phase out arming of Taiwan over time. So we are in three fronts now, any one of which could explode into nuclear disaster. That is why this speech is so profoundly relevant now. We are told every day you can't negotiate with Putin. This is false. It's false for all the reasons President Kennedy clearly gave. And if one knows history, it is the United States that has reneged repeatedly on negotiations and repeatedly chosen the unilateral path. Our propaganda doesn't say so, but if you know what's happening behind the scenes, that's the story. We have two candidates, uh, both of which are likely to create more danger and instability in the world. Neither of the two leading candidates has a track record for peace. 
I personally have endorsed Jill Stein as our uh, only peace candidate that I can see who uh, is aiming for peace across uh, all of these troubled areas. But just to say we have a major responsibility as citizens to raise our voices every day that peace is possible, that we are not gripped by forces we cannot control, that the other side is human beings that shares our uh, aspirations, our hopes, uh, our uh, yearning for peace, and that on, ba on that basis as rational people, we can find a, a way to a rational outcome. So thank you for this monthly airing of this important speech. I think it is more urgent and timely than ever that we uh, take the lessons from it for our, our day. Thank you so much.